So uh, I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker, Dr. Eileen Bulger. Uh, Eileen is a friend and colleague uh, at Harborview. Uh, she's professor of surgery uh, at UW School of Medicine. She's chief of trauma services at Harborview Medical Center. Uh, she's responsible for overseeing the medical care provided by all uh, participating services in the emergency department and for ensuring the highest standards of quality and safety. She specializes in trauma, critical care, acute surgical emergencies, and her research focus involves advancements in pre-hospital care, early resuscitation of injured patients, and managing uh, necrotizing soft tissue infections, and that means very deep, uh, severe infections. I'd like to uh, tell a couple stories about Eileen. Here, the, the center, is that you, Eileen, here in the middle? So this is Eileen. Eileen's uh, past, I asked her a little bit about this. She's got a, a, a BA from Hopkins, and while uh, just after or during college, she worked and, and uh, was a firefighter paramedic in Baltimore. So she's an East Coast uh, person that came luckily to Seattle. She says she met her husband in the, in the firehouse. So I think that's a, a great uh, uh, segue into some of the stories she's going to tell you tonight. I know uh, Eileen, uh, probably this, uh, this picture here to your left, is that Haiti, Eileen? Both, both of them are Haiti. Both are Haiti. So Eileen came to me in uh, probably 2010 when the big earthquake occurred and she was so excited. She said, I got to do a cesarean section. So uh, <laughs> she delivered a baby and she did a lot of, of other things, uh, volunteered during the uh, emergencies and tragedies that were happening with the earthquake in 2010. She came to the university uh, in 1992 for her surgical training, joined Harborview in 2000 where she was associate director for emergency surgical services from 2000 to 2008 and director of the emergency uh, department from 2008 to 2012. She served as president of the medical staff in 2007. She's active in the state trauma system, serving as chair of emergency medical service and trauma steering committee. She's a successful researcher with numerous grants, publications in the field of trauma resuscitation. So I looked at Eileen's CV in preparation to introduce her tonight. Uh, the notable things to me is she has served on the National Institutes of, uh, of Health uh, review committees. Uh, she has multiple grants and is incredibly prolific with over 150 publications in her field. She is a uh, mentor to so many individuals, uh, not only in medicine, but in, in other fields within the university. And she is one of our uh, most noted and uh, revered female surgeons within our community. Dr. Bolger earned her medical degree from Cornell and completed her internship and residency at the University of Washington, and we are absolutely thrilled that she has stayed with us, mentored so many of our students, and grown the programs here. So I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Eileen, and she's going to give us a little more information about how well is Seattle prepared for disasters, mass casualty management. So I realized when we put this program together that I made a mistake in letting David go first because I don't know if I can follow that act. Uh, but I do hope to keep your heart rate up a little bit because I'm going to challenge you with a scenario uh, that is what keeps me up at night, uh, and that would be a big earthquake in the city of Seattle. So I want you to think a little bit right now about where you expect to be tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Think about where you're going to be. Think about where the rest of your family is going to be. Uh, think about if you have kids. They're going to be in school, I hope. Right? I want to think about, right, right, right now, think about where you're going to be, because this is what we're going to talk about. It's Wednesday, March 4th, 2015, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and the earth starts to shake. And we have a 6.7 shallow crust earthquake along the Seattle Fault. And everybody thinks about the faults off of the coast, um, but I'm going to show you the Seattle Fault, which is probably the scariest fault line we have in, in this area. Uh, hundreds of buildings in downtown Seattle will collapse. 
uh, particularly in areas at high risk, uh, Pioneer Square, Capitol Hill. We have a lot of unreinforced masonry in those areas. Uh, we have major damage to all of our area bridges. So think about what that's going to do to the traffic and our ability to move around the city to deal with the crisis. Uh, I-90 bridge collapses. There are cars in the water. Uh, traffic comes to a complete standstill. And there's widespread power outages, and the national, natural gas is disrupted. So here's the Seattle fault line. It runs right across uh, the peninsula, Hood Canal, right across the city of Seattle, across Mercer Island, and across uh, the east side. So that is going to be a big problem for us. Right? It's going to cut off all of our north-south transportation on both sides of the lake and east-west issues with I-90. Here's a closer up view of that. So again, looking at the fault line that runs right through here, that's a big problem for us. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a fault line. And the rupture of this fault line is going to raise the south side of this fault line six and a half feet above the north side. OK? Six and a half feet disruption in the ground right there. We're going to have a lot of shaking. And this is a seismic map from the US uh, uh, Geologic Service that looks at the degree of shaking in various parts of the city. Darker is worse, and in our port area, the southern part of the city, we have very poor ground soil. And not only are we going to have shaking there, but they're concerned actually about liquefaction or uh, destabilization of the whole soil in that area. So even if the buildings are reinforced, they still may collapse from that uh, problem. Heavy shaking up here in Magnolia, Queen Anne, but, but pretty significant damage throughout the entire city. All right, your telephones aren't working, wherever you are. You've decided where you are now, right? You can't call anybody because your cell phone is immediately overloaded because everybody picks up their cell phone when the ground shakes, right? Even when you have uh, a bunch of Seahawks fans in downtown Seattle, the cell phones stop working, right? So your cell phone doesn't work. Your children are in school. You can't contact them, right? You don't know what's happening with your family. Uh, fires break out, right, because the gas lines have ruptured. So we have fires now. West Seattle's on fire. Uh, we don't have any water to put the fire out. And we have some tsunami waves that start to strike up uh, on our waterfront. So ongoing insult after insult. OK, so now I have your heart rate up. Let me tell you what the simulations. And this is, this is an actual scenario that's been simulated in disaster planning. You can find it online if you really want to read all the details of the report. This is what they think we'll see from a medical perspective. About 1,600 deaths in our community from this uh, event, about 858 life-threatening injuries, about 5,223 patients that need to be hospitalized, uh, 18,000 people with minor injury, and about 46,000 houses that you can no longer live in. So think of the number of people we have to shelter in that environment. OK, so I have your heart rate up. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Washington State trauma system. I think it's really important to know uh, the system that uh, we build our response on. And it is one of the, I think I would argue, one of the best systems in the country. So it's valuable to know that background. Then we'll go back to the scenario and talk about what will be the local EMS and trauma system response to this disaster. We'll talk about how we organize disaster planning for the region. What would happen a little bit higher up at the county level, at the state level? What federal resources might we anticipate uh, in this type of event? And then I'll end with, very much like David did, what you need to do to be prepared for this event. Because it is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we have an earthquake in this region. It may not be this fault line. It could be a different fault line. But we are at very high risk, and this is what we need to think about. So let me tell you a little bit about the Washington State Trauma System. The Washington State Trauma System is not as old as you might think. It was established in 1990. Uh, the law that, that oversees it is called the Trauma Care Systems Act. But this law is very valuable because it did a number of things. It set a very uh, important, clear line of authority. This uh, the system comes under the Department of Health with the Office of EMS and Trauma. And it has a steering committee, which uh, Susan mentioned I currently chair that committee. It's a committee of stakeholders from across the state police, fire, hospitals, anybody that's involved in emergency trauma care and response has sort of a seat at this table. And that's the committee that oversees the functioning of this whole system. 
this uh, gave us the authorization to designate trauma services, and we'll talk in some detail about what that means, but hospitals are designated at different levels based on their capability to care for trauma patients, and that tells the EMS providers where to take the patient. Uh, we can verify pre-hospital trauma services, so the folks that you just saw today do a beautiful demonstration of cardiac arrest are also verified in how they take care of trauma patients. Uh, we have adopted field triage criteria across the entire state, so again, the paramedics can decide based on the severity of the injury what level of hospital they should take the patient to. We have regionalized planning and implementation, which I'll show you. We've integrated uh, trauma injury prevention uh, efforts into this process. We have a unique um, trauma registry where every hospital in the state that's part of the trauma system has to submit data on every patient they admit to this registry. So we have a very robust database that allows us to look at what types of injuries we're seeing across the state, where do we need to do more injury prevention, and where do we need to do system improvement, is our mortality improving, that sort of thing. And we have regional quality improvement activities as part of that as well. Important concept to understand is there are really two types of systems around the country. Every state has its own trauma system. Actually, there are only a couple of states that don't totally have an organized trauma system now, but every state has one, and they're, but, they've, but they're different models. And the two basic philosophical approaches are you can have an inclusive system or an exclusive system. What an inclusive system does is allow as, as many hospitals as you can engage in the process to participate at some level. That doesn't mean you put 12 level one trauma centers in one city because that exceeds the population need and, and violates the whole principle we talked about with the tiered paramedic response, right? You want to concentrate your resources for the most severely injured in a small number of centers. But you want to engage all the rural hospitals, the hospitals that are out there in eastern Washington and they're the only hospital around to care for somebody who's in a car crash and make them part of the system so they have trauma training and they know how to stabilize a patient and then move them on to another level of care. So that's an inclusive approach. And that allows you to designate hospitals anywhere from a level one to a level five, which we'll talk about. Other systems use an exclusive approach, which is basically to centralize the care in a limited number of larger centers and not worry about what happens out there in the hinterland. So here's a map of the United States that gives you a feeling for the different approaches that different states have taken. And so I think you can see the, all these little pins on the map are trauma centers. So you can see that Washington is a very inclusive state. We have 80 designated trauma centers in the state of Washington. Uh, Oregon is very inclusive as well. Oklahoma, Texas, Iowa. I think every hospital in Iowa must be part of the system. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't know there were that many hospitals in Iowa, but there are. Uh, but you can see that the other states, California, for example, has concentrated their resources in smaller number of centers in urban areas. Um, and, and other states, which are pretty rural, don't have a huge number of centers either. And then, uh, you know, some less inclusive approaches. Florida, for example, is pretty lo low on the inclusiveness level. So that just gives you a feel for how different states have taken a different approach to this issue. What are the different levels mean? So we designate hospitals in Washington State from level one to level five. Level one is Harborview. Level one is 24-7 availability of every surgical specialist, everybody you could think of to care for any injury, right? So a hand surgeon, a urologist, an olaryngologist, every specialty you could think of, a gynecologist, you know, is gonna deliver your baby in the ER, right? So, so th that's the, sort of the highest level. And th those centers also are required to have ongoing research activities and be a training center, teach the next generation. Level two centers have to have 24-7 surgical response for the key services that treat life-threatening trauma. And those are general surgery, orthopedics, and neurosurgery. Level three centers have to have 24-7 surgical capability for general surgery and orthopedics, but usually don't have any neurosurgeons. Level four centers may or may not have a general surgeon, may or may not have an operating room they can open right away, probably not. And their job really is to stabilize a patient and transfer them, move them on to the next level. And level five could be a clinic, you know, something, or a critical access hospital, very small 10-bed hospital in a very rural area, may not have any surgeons, usually has no surgeons, uh, may have one ER physician, maybe a family practice doc. And they're all engaged in the system. So Harborview, we've heard, heard a lot about Harborview. We're proud of Harborview, I have to admit. I've, I've been there my whole life, it feels like. i uh, probably die there. Um, <laughs> not soon, I hope. Uh, but um, but it is, it is uh, the only level one adult and pediatric trauma center for the state. Uh, we are a very high volume center in the top five in the country. We have about 6,000 admissions for trauma a year. 
Um, we serve an area of about 7 million people because we don't only serve the state of Washington, but we serve southeast Alaska, western Montana, parts of Idaho. All those areas don't have a level one trauma center. And about 30% of our, our patients are transferred from other hospitals. The rest come from usually within King County or by air from the, from the peninsula. So this is a map of the, how the state is divided into regions for the trauma system. So we are sitting in central region, which is King County. It's the only region that encompasses only one county. It's the most populous county. Uh, so that's reasonable, I guess. Um, but you can see that to our north, we have the north region, uh, west region, and, and northwest region out on the peninsula. And each of these regions are organized with a regional council that brings all the hospitals in that region together to work on common problems and to work on quality improvement for trauma care and to look at how they're moving patients between hospitals to make sure they're doing it right. This is a map. It's a little bit out of date. It's, it's the most recent one I, we have. Um, the only thing that's different here is that uh, Providence Everett now was a level three, is now a level two. Um, but you can see that uh, these are all these dots on here are all the trauma centers in the state by level. So uh, Harborview is the red in the middle here. We have level twos in Tacoma. Uh, both um, St. Joseph's Hospital and Tacoma Hospital share a level two designation and alternate trauma call. And Mary Bridge is a level two pediatric facility. Again, we have a level two in Everett. We have a level two down here in Vancouver. And then we have a level twos out in Spokane. The rest of the state is covered with a combination of level threes, and then when you get out in these rural areas, primarily level fours, the purple dots are level fives. So you can see how we've really tried to cover the state with at least some access to basic trauma care. What does that look like for transportation? You know, we talk about the golden hour in trauma. We'd like to get a patient to, to the highest level, of, at least to surgical care within an hour. Uh, this is the area shaded on the map that we can do that by either air or ground, get a patient to a level one or two center in our state. Well, it doesn't look like much of the surface area, that's 88% of our population. Because again, most of these rural areas have le much less people. But there are parts of the state, if you're vacationing in, let's say Lake Chelan, where you're gonna be more than an hour to get to a level one or two trauma center. So we think trauma centers are good, we think we're great, right? Uh, but what's the evidence? Right? Is there evidence out there that says being cared for in a trauma center makes a difference? And, and there is, and this is probably the, the landmark paper. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. And several of the authors are actually from Harborview. Not all of them, some of them are from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. It was a nationwide study that looked at if you have serious injury and you are cared for in a level one or two trauma center versus being cared for in a non-trauma center, how do you do? And you have a 25% greater chance of survival if you're cared for in a trauma center. And again, it comes back to that issue of practice makes perfect, right? And be, being in a place where people are used to dealing with those problems on a routine basis uh, does improve your outcome. So that's the everyday, you know, one patient at a time kind of thing like you saw today. But what do we do in an event like this? So this is a picture from the Madrid train bombings. You can think of several other examples, right? The Boston Marathon bombings, uh, several other recent uh, catastrophes where you have faced with a large number of patients in a very short period of time, many of whom are, are critically injured. And so this is where you really test the system. How do you manage this large number of patients? How do you get them triaged appropriately? And how do you get them to the right hospitals? And I would argue to you that the trauma system should be the backbone bone for disaster planning. Because if you think about it, a lot of, in the past, a lot of this has fallen on sort of the public health agencies who are really great at dealing with infectious and communicable diseases, but aren't really specialized at injury. And if you think about the things that threaten us, terrorist events, which are largely explosions, as we've seen in Boston, or earthquakes, which are largely crush injuries and burns, which we'll talk about, uh, the trauma centers are used to that. That's what they do every day. And most major trauma centers also do advanced burn care, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the EMS agencies, the guys that you saw earlier, are used to triaging. They're used to getting people to those, to those centers. So that's really the backbone for disaster planning. So let's come back now to our scenario. All right, it's Wednesday, March 4th. It's 1 o'clock. The ground's shaking. Big earthquake. Lots of buildings collapse. Traffic is horrible. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, in King County, these are your trauma centers. So you have uh, Harborview, again, adult and pediatric level 1. Level 3s are Overlake. Valley Medical Center in Auburn Regional, and level four is at Evergreen, Northwest, and Highline. So if you look at the map, you think we might have planned it, right? It's very nice. They're very nicely geographically distributed. 
up and down the I-5 corridor, up and down the 405 corridor. This is Enum College's level five. Um, but, you, but very nicely distributed so that when this earthquake cuts off the city, at least we have some both on the both sides. That's good, right? Um, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna call 911, because that's what we've been trained to do whenever there's an emergency while your phone isn't working. And if it is, you know what's gonna happen? They're not gonna talk to you. Because the actual plan for 911 dispatch in the event of a big earthquake or a big cata major cat catastrophic event like this is to actually stop taking your calls. So I'm sorry, if you do get through, they're too busy because their goal is actually to alert the police and fire stations to begin a disaster assessment mode. It's a change in focus. The police and the fire will rally at their local stations and they will drive then a very defined life safety route that covers the entire city. They will just drive around. And the reason they're driving around is to, is to figure out where the major problems are, right? to do a damage assessment of the city. They will assess for building collapse, they will look for where the fires are, and they will assess what the damage is to our roads and bridges and start to close those bridges so we don't have more people going off of them, right? And so the very first part of the response, you are on your own, okay? <laughs> because they are busy trying to figure out where they need to put their resources. And this is their, this is their plan. And, and it's hard for them, it's hard for any of us to bypass an event, but they're gonna bypass you if you're in crisis while they figure out the big picture, all right? Uh, the city and the county both have what are called emergency operations centers that they will stand up in this type of event uh, with whoever's available on site and then with more people coming as, as, avail as able with the traffic and such things. Uh, this is the center point to collect all that damage assessment information and then to relay it outside of our region because this is such a big event, we're gonna need help from outside of our region. So they will communicate with the state and start to get those resources mobilized and they will deploy resources to close the damaged bridges to traffic, and the police will prioritize specific traffic routes to try to clear you out of the way so they can move the EMS vehicles to where they need to move them and they can clear paths to the hospital. So this is the plan. Um, and then they will begin an inspection of predefined shelters. So every part of the city has a predefined shelter place. You may not know that, but you do in your neighborhood. Um, but it needs to be inspected to ensure that it's sound to, to be uh, used, and then there are caches or supplies for shelters, cots and blankets and stuff, dispersed in various places around the city that can be used uh, for those types of sh shelters. So that will go on as well, because we mentioned well, how many people, 46,000 households are gonna need to be sheltered, right? It might be raining tomorrow, I don't know. So we need to sort that out. There's a very uh, important group called the Northwest Health uh, Care Response Network, and I put their website on the bottom here for you if you're interested in this. Um, this is really the cornerstone of the planning on the medical side, which is what I'm most involved with. The Northwest Healthcare Response Network is administered by both King County and Pierce County Public Health. It's a joint effort between the two counties. Um, and it's a voluntary network, but it involves really all of the healthcare organizations. So all the hospitals in the two counties, the nursing homes, the dialysis centers, all of those groups have kind of come together to say, you know, we need to work together in planning for this type of event. And so they work together, they train together, they provide re share resources for management of these types of things, um, and they have a very good website that's on there if you're interested. One of the most important roles from the medical side of this response uh, is the Disaster Medical Control Center. And Harborview is, is in that role. Uh, the mission of that is to really be the, the point place to organize the medical response. And that means assessing what the capabilities of all the hospitals are, how many patients they can take, communicating with the EMS system and figuring out how to distribute patients among the different hospitals. It's really designed to sort of fill the gap before these uh, emergency operation centers can get up and running, uh, that we can operate, open the DMCC within a minute's notice. When the ground shakes, we would start it. Uh, we use the personnel that are already in the ED to, to get the process rolling. I'm gonna show you some more detail about how that works but it really is something that can come up very quickly for organizing at least the medical side of the response. Uh, these are the various functions. Uh, we do a lot of communication. We have um, uh, organized radio communications that I'll show you so that we can contact the different hospitals in the region, speak with the field responders, speak with the different agencies, work with King County Public Health. Uh, we activate and notify, and it gets the hospital disaster system uh, uh, rolling. 
Um, we have um, ongoing event uh, planning and training that's done through the DMCC. And then the main function is really patient distribution. So it's figuring out which hospitals are capable of taking patients, because some hospitals might be damaged, right? They may not have power, so they, they may not be the best place to send people. So figuring out who can take patients and what level of severity of patients they can take both in the region and then outside if we have to move patients further away. Um, and uh, do a damage assessment for the hospitals. So Harborview is, that, is in that role, and the backup to Harborview, should something happen to Harborview, is Overlake. Uh, in catastrophic events, like the one we're talking about right now, uh, then the role stretches out into coordination between the different counties, and there are DMCCs in each county. So for example, Providence Everett is a DMCC to the north of us. Tacoma, we would work with the DMCC there, and we would coordinate among those uh, uh, for a wider uh, distribution of patients if we need to do that. So here's a picture of the radio room at Harborview. This is where we would run the DMCC. Um, and this is, I've got it kind of from two angles, but this is as you're walking in the door. And you can see here a, a whole bank of radios. Um, we have a number, of, I'll show you a number of redundant communication systems, satellite phones, radios, ham radios, anything we can think of because we don't know what's going to work. But we know the cell phone isn't going to work. And the phones on the wall over here may not work, right? This is a list of all the hospitals in the county. And this is a, a kind of a running tally of what their bed status is, what their capability is for ICU patients, operative patients, and so forth. And we routinely drill this where we will call all the hospitals on the radio and do a bed check. Um, but we keep that up there. And we also have a web-based system that I'll show you. But that may not work. So we have redundancy. These are all the different communication systems that we have. Again, we can staff it right away with both an uh, ED charge nurse and ED attending. We have clinical engineers who actually know how to work the radios, can fix them. Um, and they're immediately available as well. And so these are all the different uh, systems that we have to try to make this system work. Uh, we also have something called WATRAC, which I will show you in a minute, which was uh, developed by the Northwest Healthcare Response uh, Group. This is the other side of the radio room. So here's the door. So it's not a big space, but it's sound insulated, which is nice, so you don't have to listen to the chaos of the emergency department. Uh, we have a TV so we can see what the media is saying, because they often know more than we do. Right? Um, and, um, and this is where we also run our day-to-day -day communication with the EMS providers in the field that David talked about. They, they always talk to a doctor, right, about a case. This is WATRAC. So it's an, a web-based system that gives us sort of a continuous, ongoing tracking of the hospitals in the region. This is showing the page for King County, so all the hospitals in King County. And these are not just the trauma centers, but every hospital in King County. Because in a disaster situation, everybody has to play, right? We try to send the sickest patients to trauma centers, but everybody's going to play. And they can color code themselves based on their capabilities and, their, and how open they are right now. Everybody looks pretty good. Um, but we can also drill down into here as to how many beds they have open and so forth. So they can update this in a real-time basis, assuming, of course, the web is working. We'll see. So what happens in the emergency department? So we stand up the DMCC. We notify the ED leadership and start to gather as much information as we can about the event. We would call an internal disaster for the hospital through our nursing supervisor, and that's announced overhead. The maximum number is 100 patients. I think we might get more than that in this kit scenario, but it's announced overhead so the staff can prepare. And we activate a departmental plan to begin to call in more manpower right, to care for these patients. And of course, hospital leadership is alerted, which allows us to activate the hospital disaster plan. What do we need? One of the biggest problems we have is, and things that we worry about is surge, something called surge capacity. Right? If we're expecting a huge influx of patients, well, we already got a bunch of patients. Right? On an average day, our ER is pretty full. I don't know if you've been in the Harborview ER. Right? But on an average Friday night, it's pretty full. There are people in the hallways. Right? Um, so we have to make space. We have to stop doing elective operations so we have operating rooms available to do cases. Uh, we have to be able to expand our care into other parts of the hospital so we close our clinics and we can put acute care into clinic spaces. We can run. Uh, less acute patients through there as well, to off offload the emergency department. And we can expand our ICU spaces into places like the recovering room for the operating room. So these are all things that we plan for, uh, to be able to expand our space and then also to get rid of people who don't need to be in the hospital. Because there are a few always laying around that don't need to be there. So we're going to discharge you. Sorry, you're going to go home. So you know that's part of the plan. We have to figure out who can go home, who can safely leave so we can make space for some of these patients. Staff is a big issue because we need more staff to take care of these patients. 
So we have an all staff alert communication plan, we have phone trees, we have lots of ways to call in more staff. Uh, of course, they're worried about their kids are in school too. Right? So you have to deal with that. And then equipment is a real problem because most hospitals function under what's called just-in-time ordering. Right? So they have what they need for the next day or two, but they don't have enough to keep going for a week on their own. Not enough oxygen, not enough bandages, not enough anything. So we have contracts with people to send us stuff in an emergency setting, but they have to be able to get to us. So we are concerned about that. So here's what the ER looks like, and this is what it should look like before uh, the disaster because there's nobody there. Um, so that's good. And, and you, you think this is a tremendous amount of space for two patients, right? I can stuff a whole lot more patients in there. So again, surge capacity, this is what I do on a normal day. I have all this lovely space to work. But if I need to, I can put you know, three more stretchers in that space. And I can do that. So, so we think about how we're going to surge that. So anybody remember this event? A few people, a few hands. Remember this event? I was in the ER that day. So this is a multiple casualty incident, or an MCI. This is when a Metro bus driver was shot on a Sunday morning and went off the end of the Aurora Bridge. Okay. Fortunately, it was Sunday morning, so there weren't a lot of people on the bus. But it was still a multiple casualty incident. We operated, opened our DMCC, just like we do for any multiple casualty incident, because it gives us a chance to see how it works, not just for earthquakes, right? It's for any big event. And we triage the patients to different hospitals in, this, in the area and got it taken care of. This we do very commonly. Not this particular scene very commonly, but, you know, multiple shooting events, uh, anything where we think there's going to be a large group of patients, two big vans full of people crash together, we're going to call an MCI, the fire department's going to call an MCI, we're going to stand up the DMCC. This is every day. This is not every day. Right? This is a picture, aerial picture from Haiti uh, from the earthquake. And I had the opportunity to go there. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and it was, it was impressive how much devastation there was. Now they have building codes not as good as ours, but still um, we're looking at, at a similar type of event today. So what's the state and federal response? Is the cavalry going to come and save us? Right? And, and the state has an EOC that they will stand up as well. Um, and they are the ones that will communicate with the federal government. Uh, the governor has to declare a disaster. The, the federal government will not come help you unless the governor declares a disaster. I sh I'm pretty sure he would for the Seattle earthquake. Um, and would put in a request for federal support. The governor can activate the National Guard, which I'm sure he would, to help. Uh, and regional search and rescue teams we can get in, which we need, because we have all these buildings down. We need to find people in them. The federal government uh, has uh, something called disaster medical assistance teams. Um, we actually have one in Washington State. All those people would be busy during this disaster, so they wouldn't respond to that. Um, but but uh, they would be sent to us, but it would take about 72 hours to get that help. Uh, and regional patient evacuation, getting patients out of our region, which is largely done by the military, will also take 72 hours to start. So we have to think from medical side of things that we are on our own for 72 hours. And we have to figure out how to manage all these patients I talked about for 72 hours. The National Disaster Medical System is a branch under Health and Human Services. Uh, and as I mentioned, they have four different kinds of response teams. They have the disaster medical assistance teams, which are uh, in every state. Washington has one. Some states, like California, which are big states with lots of disasters, have two or three. Um, some states have even more. Florida has a lot for hurricanes. Uh, these are teams uh, largely of emergency physicians, paramedics, people who can go into an event and help triage and sort patients, but they don't provide definitive care. They can augment an emergency department someplace. There are, are three international surgical, medical surgical response teams. They're called IMSERT. Uh, there's one based here in Seattle. It's run out of Harborview. Uh, there's one at Mass General, and there's one at uh, the University of Miami. These are fully operative teams. Field Hospital, MASH. Anybody old enough to see MASH? Okay, when I talk to the medical students, they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I grew up on MASH, and, and this is a MASH unit. All right, it's a fully functional field hospital, can operate, um, has all of those resources. And, and that's the, the team I went to Haiti with, which, will, which I can show you some pictures from. But, but uh, all those people in this region are going to be busy working in their own hospitals, so that's not going to help us for a while either, because they have to come from Boston or Miami. Right? Uh, there are d disaster mortician teams, which sounds kind of grim, but I mentioned there's a lot of fatalities, and all those people need to be identified, and that's too much work for your local ME, so you will likely get a federal team that will help with that. 
Uh, and then there are veterinary medical assistance teams if you have a lot of animals at risk, which we may or may not have, I don't know. So this is a picture of um, some of the folks from the insert team uh, on our way to Haiti, looking very happy and clean and, and uh, before we got there. Um, again, it's a full field uh, hospital capability. It has surgeons, emergency physicians, pediatricians. We like to have OBGYN. We didn't have it for a while, which is why I had to do some C-sections, which I hadn't done since medical school. Um, anesthesiologists, you know, all of the people you would think you need to run a hospital, basically. Uh, and we use firefighters for communications and logistics support because they're really smart at that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're going to respond on a disaster team, there are really things that you have to think about. And a lot of people turned up in Haiti uh, who ha were really of good intention. The nurses, uh, you know, they somehow found a flight and they got down there and they showed up at the camp door and said, I want to help. I'm here to help. I'm a nurse. It doesn't work that way, right? Because you really need to know that the personnel you have are trained, that you have the appropriate equipment to, to be useful. You have some security. This is our security in Haiti. I like these guys, 18-year-olds with really big guns. Um, <laughs> transportation, you know, you have to be able to feed your team. And in places like Haiti, you have to think about things like malaria prophylaxis and vaccinations and so. So it's a big, it's a big deal. And, and if, you're, if you're interested in disaster response and you want to be on a disaster team, I would say join a team. It's very well established. There are volunteer teams you can join. Um, and train with them, because then you, you'll know you'll respond and you'll be useful. But this is our setup of the insert hospital, the MASH unit. It's tent-based. Uh, we were in this courtyard here uh, with, our, with our field hospital. This is our uh, intensive care unit, uh, and uh, the other side is the ER, so basically one tent for both. Uh, this is the operating room, and uh, these are the, this is the pediatrics ward and the adult ward. Uh, so you can put a hospital into tents pretty well. But again, for our scenario, you're not going to see any of these people for 72 hours, all right? Uh, so what do we have in Washington? We have one DMAT team. It's called the Washington One DMAT. We have the Insert West team, as I talked about, uh, based out of Harborview, but of no use to you in this scenario because they're all working in Harborview. All right, so a couple things I want to touch on that I think are important to think about in this particular situation or in any mass casualty situation, and one is burns. So we mentioned, I told you West Seattle was on fire, right? Uh, and burns are not uncommon injuries after an earthquake. You might not think about that, but they are. And they're certainly very common after terrorist events. And about a third of the patients that were hospitalized after 9-11 were burn patients from that event. Um, and burn patients are challenging, very challenging. They require very specialized care. The average burn in a mass casualty event is about 50% of the body surface area, so a big burn. And for every sort of percent body surface area is a day in the ICU. So if you have a 50% burn, you've got to anticipate that patient's going to be in your ICU for 50 days, right? So huge resource intensive, very specialized care, something really unique that we need to think about. There are thousands of trauma centers. I showed you there's 80 in, in Washington, right? There's one burn center in Washington, right? There's only 132 burn centers in the whole country. And that makes about 1,800, 1,900 burn beds in the country. And only about 45 of those centers are actually verified or certified by the American Burn Association. So the other ones are, they're calling themselves burn center, but it's not really clear what they are, right? So, so it's a big deal. And so the American Burn Association has spent a lot of time thinking about this, and they have policy statements on disaster planning. And they, their goal is to get a burn victim to a burn center within 24 hours. So in a mass casualty event, that's a big deal. Uh, they have worked hard with the National Disaster Medical Service. They develop a tracking system nationwide for burn care so that you can be triaged and transported out of the region to another burn center. So, you know, for us, patients might go to Portland, they might go to Utah uh, to get to the next closest burn center. So this is our resource tracking system. It's a web-based system. Uh, it's run, uh, again, by the National Disaster Medical Service, and they update it. All the burn centers participate in this. They update it every week or so what their status is, how many beds they have, uh, so that if we, can, if we have a big event, we can move people around the country. Another special group that we have to think about are kids, right? And not all hospitals care for kids. You may not know that, but um, a lot of hospitals, that's not their focus, right? Uh, and, but in the disaster, they have to care for kids. Everybody has to care for everybody, right? So we do a lot of work on training uh, around that issue. And the Northwest Healthcare Coalition that I mentioned earlier um, has put out hospital guidelines for the management of pediatric patients in disasters and does a lot of training with those hospitals that aren't used to taking care of kids, making sure that they have all the things that they would need. 
Do you have formula you know, in your hospital? Those kinds of things. Because you may have to take care of kids in this situation. So a lot of work has gone into that in our region. Finally, practice makes perfect. And I think, you know, again, these are rare events, so we have to drill them. And we drill them frequently. Uh, this is a, a picture of our, one of the drills in our emergency department. The person in the center is Ann Newcomb, who is not only the clinical director of the emergency center department, but really the uh, guru on disaster management for our, all of UW Medicine. She really coordinates that effort. This is a picture of the Hospital Emergency Operations Center. They look very bored, I think. But, but you can see how it's, you know, it's a quiet space far away from the emergency department. Nobody's looking at their phone. Where there is computer capability, lots of phones, and they would coordinate the hospital response this is where they would find out what equi more equipment we need, get that just-in-time ordering, all that kind of stuff done uh, for us, make sure the generators are running, things like that. And we involve our trainees. So this is one of our pediatrics residents uh, involved in a disaster drill. You can see he's triaging this little baby, um, reading her injuries off a card there. But that's what we do. We bring in uh, sometimes live people, sometimes volunteers, and sometimes mannequins. Um, but we bring in patients in large numbers and have the residents work through how they would triage them and get them through the system quickly. So what are, what are our challenges? I think our challenges uh, that still remain are how we deal with surge capacity, how we get more in space when we don't have much space to begin with. Uh, patient triage and tracking. Tracking's a huge issue because it's chaotic, right? It's a chaotic situation. There's lots of patients. People don't know who they are when they come in, and we need to reunite them with their families. So tracking is a huge problem, especially if you're moving people around from one hospital to another. Uh, distribution of patients is a big issue, and one of the problems we find is that uh, if you are injured but you can walk, you're going to walk up the hill. If you can make it up the hill, you're not too badly injured, right? If you can make it up James Street, right? And you're going to come into the ER way before the sick people, because the sick people are stuck in a building somewhere or in a fire, right? And they have to, somebody has to get to them and rescue them. So many hospitals are overloaded with what we call the walking wounded before the sick people come. And so you have to have a way as a hospital to deal with that. How do you keep your emergency department open when you've got 10,000 walking wounded at your door? Right? How do you deal with that? So that's a big part of the planning. And of course, it, well, along with the walking wounded, the media get there pretty quickly too. So you have to deal with them and the family members that, who are looking for their loved ones get there. So, so it's a lot of sort of crowd management involved in this process. Security is a big part of it. And one of the things we worry about from a terrorist perspective, and this has happened around the country, uh, that first responders, the EMS providers, or the hospitals become a target, right, a secondary target. Somebody will plant a secondary device, wait for the firefighters to respond, and then set it off. Right? Uh, there have been ambulances that have been loaded with um, explosive materials and taken to hospitals after an event like this. So, so you have to think about security as well, particularly if it's, there's any hint of a terrorist type of activity. And then obviously communication becomes a cornerstone of everything we do. This is a picture, my husband's a photographer, and this is a picture he took uh, at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning on the ramp at Harborview. This is the ramp outside the ER. Is this a MCI or a disaster? No, this is a regular Saturday, Sunday, so Saturday night going into Sunday morning. This is a regular day. So this is the challenge we face. If this is a regular day, right, what happens when we really have a, a big event? So um, that's, that's what we, kind of think about a lot is how we're going to handle that. So what should you do? So David said you should take CPR class. So you all got signed up for that while you were in the break, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say there's some things you absolutely have to do. And, and this sounds cliche, and you may have heard it before, but I hope I've scared you enough, right, to do it. Because you have to have ability to support you and your family for 72 hours. And hopefully that's in your home. Hopefully your home is not destroyed, right? If it is, I'm sorry, and you'll be in a shelter. But if it's in your home and you've got to do it, you need to have a kit to do that. You need to have water, food, flashlights, batteries, things like that. There's a wonderful website put out by the federal government, your tax dollars at work, www.ready.gov. tells you a list of what you should have in your house. Please read that list. Please make a kit for your house. My husband has so many water bottles, I, can't, I trip over them. <laughs> All right? You next have to have a plan for how you're going to reunite with your family. Because it is nothing's more stressful than your kids being in school and you can't reach them and something's happened, right? Nothing. So you have to have a plan for how you're going to contact your family. And usually an out-of-state contact, people say, is the best because the phones 
might work for you to call out of state without being able to call in state. So if you have one family member out of state, and everybody in your family knows I call grandma in Maryland and make sure she knows where I am and I'm okay, then when the next person calls, they get the same message. So you have an outside contact, and you should have a meeting place somewhere in your community where you're going to meet. Maybe it's the school, maybe it's a church, but you should have a place where your family can meet. And then finally, I think you should be an informed bystander, and that's where not only learning CPR is important, but learning some basic first aid. And the most valuable thing you can do to save somebody's life from a trauma perspective is to stop them from bleeding. You can't do much about internal bleeding, but if they're externally bleeding because their limb has been trapped or they have a major penetrating injury, you can stop that bleeding. And it's very simple. It's almost as simple as a CPR. So no basic first aid, know how to put on a tourniquet. Uh, you should have tourniquets in your first aid kits. Uh, and then know what your limitations are, so you don't go running into a building that's about to collapse to try to save someone, because that won't do you any good. One thing that I think um, is a move that's afoot, um, and I've been to a couple of uh, federal meetings, actual meetings in Washington, D.C., with pe big, important people in the room saying, we should do this. Uh, we haven't figured out how to pay for it yet, so I don't know when it'll happen, because I don't know when Congress will do anything. But, the goal is to teach everybody that we teach, first, that we teach uh, CPR to how to stop bleeding. Very simple, how to put on a tourniquet, how to hold pressure on a wound. And next to your defibrillator, which you will see in every place you go, right? Every school, every hospital, every airport, every public place there's a defibrillator, which you saw the guys use. Next to the defibrillator, we would like to put a bleeding control bag, which has some gloves so you don't get all messy, and has some bandages, and has tourniquets in it. And uh, that's the move that's afoot. It's gained a lot of traction uh, nationally after the Boston Marathon bombings, um, honestly. Um, and so I think you'll see this. I don't know when. Uh, and there's a lot of work that's being developed to develop very basic, simple classes you can take for this. So that's the future. And uh, I'm sure Seattle, which is the leader in CPR, will be the leader in this as well. So that's all I have. I want to thank you very much. I hope um, I made you think a little bit about the challenges that we face. Um, hopefully it won't happen in our lifetimes, but if it does, you'll be ready. So thank you. So I want to have you all stay for question and answer if you uh, would like. Uh, in reference to what happened in New Orleans, what is the plan for, say, trauma centers that are damaged or, or um, in addition, uh, people who are immobile, uh, the elderly or people in hospitals, and you have to get them out. Yeah, I think that's a huge challenge, and that's why we have engaged all of the nursing homes and the dialysis centers and everything in, in part of this planning process, because uh, patient evacuation of those um, centers can be very challenging, and, and, and hospital evacuation as well. And in New Orleans, they do, and if you're interested in disaster management, you really want to be scared. There's a book called Five Days at Memorial uh, that you should read. Uh, it's, a, it's about the experience of a hospital in New Orleans that had to evacuate. It's very scary, actually. Um, but but uh, we drill hospital evacuation. Uh, we drill how to carry patients, ventilated patients downstairs. Um, so, so we practice that. It will take a coordinated effort, obviously, to figure out the, the best transportation mode to move people out of the hospital. Um, but we have contingencies to try to, to, try to do that. It, it, in a big event like this, what I'm talking about, the you know, big earthquake event, um, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time. So the nursing homes are working on plans to try to sustain themselves over the time period that they need before they can be evacuated as well. Next question. Uh, not a question, more of a comment. I'm surprised nothing was mentioned about CERT training. Uh, you're absolutely right that when something bad happens, we're all on our own, but community emergency response teams are something everybody should take training in because it puts you in a situation where you're able to be your own first responder. Uh, it covers uh, basic search and rescue, uh, fire suppression, first aid, um, you know, triage, all that good stuff, and puts you in a situation where you can volunteer nationally because it's done under the aegis of FEMA you can walk into any, any place after you've had the training and each certification, you, you can go anywhere to help. Yeah, actually there's there are a number of different training programs. I didn't want to endorse any one program, but that is a, an excellent program. And, you know, anything you can do 
to, to sort of prepare yourself, to enable yourself to be a useful bystander, I think is valuable. Um, because you are going to be on your own. And a lot of communities have, have formed their own neighborhood uh, groups to, to, to have people that are going to check on the you know, elderly people in their community and so forth uh, in an event like this. So, so structuring with you in your own neighborhood, within your own community, a response is very valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question here. I was um, kind of surprised to hear that burns are a common injury in a big earthquake. And, and so I wonder if one has to be on their own for that long with a serious burn person. What do you do? Yeah, there's not a lot you can do. The most important thing is to keep them dry uh, and, and warm, so covered with dry, warm blankets. Um, they, the biggest, one of the biggest problems they have is they have a lot of heat loss. Right, so they can become hypothermic very quickly. So trying to keep them warm, um, and and trying to support them if they're having you know difficulty breathing and things like that. But there's not a whole lot that that a, unfortunately that a bystander can do for a burn victim. Yeah. Next question. In in the disaster scenario, if you're uninjured but you're caring for seriously injured people, you said 911 stops working, first responders are in their assessment mode. What do you do? Do you just stay with the person until someone happens to come by, or do you tr attempt to transport them yourself, or do you just keep tr calling 911 until they start answering? So it depends a little bit on the circumstances. Um, if, uh, if there appear to be an immediately life-threatening circumstance, you're probably best to do your best to transport them yourself, um, you know, however you can, to a hospital, whatever the closest hospital is. Um, if uh, you think you've got a little more time, then waiting till 911 is working again and letting them know that you're where you are, you can do that. But, it, but, but how long that time period is gonna take is really unknown, because it depends on the scope of the disaster. So this is a circumstance where you know, a lot of people are gonna be brought into the hospital by their neighbors or by their bystanders, yeah. Thank you. Another question here. I'm wondering with the concern about oil trains um, exploding, what kind of scenarios you've run through in terms of planning for that and whether, I can't think in my mind right now whether Harborview is in the blast zone area that close to the tracks or if it's far enough away that it wouldn't get damaged in case of, a, uh, of an explosion. Sure. sure. <coughs> so I work closely with the Seattle Fire Department. Uh, there is uh, lots of uh, planners that have um, imaginative and maybe even nefarious imaginations. And so they've thought about this, what happens if a train explodes under the city in the, in the tunnel. Uh, Harvey, thankfully, because we're uphill, uh, is, uh, we're usually safe. It, sometimes for some things, depending on the wind, it could be a challenge. Um, but most of the hospitals in Seattle will be safe. Um, the challenge will be the walking wounded that Dr. Boulder described, you know, who are injured downtown in a train tunnel. Uh, incident who are walking up the hill, but but it's uh, certainly been thought of, and the uh, the planners for the city, the emergency operations centers have really considered sort of every worst case scenario that they can think of. When I took first aid quite a while ago, uh, they were discouraging the use of tourniquets because apparently there were a lot of cowboys with tourniquets, and I was curious how is that changing? Th yeah, uh, that how has the thought changed? There's been a sea change. Uh, because when I was in medical school, the same thing. They were told, oh, don't put tourniquets on. You're gonna, all these legs are going to die, right? Um, and, and this has largely come out of our experience in the military in the recent conflicts. You know, so unfortunately, we've been involved in some conflicts uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq where a lot of the injuries are a result of IEDs, right? I improvised explosive devices. And with modern body armor, uh, that affects your extremities more than anything else. And so we've seen huge numbers of injured soldiers with uh, traumatic amputations uh, who, whose lives have been saved by tourniquets. There's no question. And so uh, that data has been re-looked at, uh, both in the military and civilian communities. And um, there's been a resurgence in promotion of the use of tourniquets, uh, particularly in um, major events. You know, Boston Marathon bombing was another example of this from a civilian side. Uh, so there's been a, a huge uh, move afoot to train uh, all law enforcement providers to put on tourniquets and to carry tourniquets. So all the police, uh, all the basic firefighters, um, and now we're reaching out to the public. 
So it has been a sea change. Uh, you know, what people worry about is, oh, I'm going to put it on and then they're not going to get enough blood flow to that leg and they're going to lose that leg. Usually if you're putting it on for life-threatening bleeding, they're at risk of losing that leg anyway from the injury. So you're better off to save their life and, and then we'll deal with it. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It's a wonderful session.